well, you were just telling me quite a gruesome story about your health, and I just thought we should probably record this. So t- tell me what you were saying. Well, we were touring in South America. Uh, nothing against South America, of course. No, we were touring out there, and uh, me, myself, and our sound guy, me, Milo, and uh, and uh, our sound guy, James, all came back sick. Um, and I don't know what it was from, but... I really had a really bad nasal and throat infection, right? And and so f- I'm I'm barely getting over it now. Okay. Um, what so is, if you see me cough, it's you know still a little bit there. But uh, I had to go to an ears, eyes, throat specialist because it's the worst cough I've ever had. So where I basically kind of lost my voice. I did lose my voice, so I couldn't do interviews for a little while. And I know that some of you were trying to get a hold of me to, to, to talk to me to do interviews but I just couldn't talk so I went to the specialist they actually put a camera through my nose going down to my throat just to make sure I wanted him to do that just to make sure I didn't have any throat damage luckily you know vocal cord damage luckily there was nothing like that right. it's just it's just one of those really bad infections and it just it's been like a month now like four weeks now that I'm actually able to talk to you so I'm glad this interview is finally getting to happen. Yeah, no, totally. Well, listen, I mean, nothing's more important than health. I don't want to. I don't want to creep out anyone who is listening. But a couple of years ago, I had to have a similar thing, but up the other end. Mm. And I tell you what, that was that was like a horror movie, man. Yeah, I've had something similar to that too. Uh, coming back from Mexico, uh, just you know. I was extremely dehydrated. Actually, I was on tour. I was actually uh, going. This is another another event. I was going from Israel all the way down to Portugal, flying. Uh, we had we were in the middle of a tour, and somewhere along the along the way, we had stopped off somewhere. We had some food. Somewhere along the way, I just it something hit me, and I just uh, had really bad um, diarrhea. <laughs> And it was so bad that um, I was hallucinating, I was sweating, and I was like, um, I was dehydrated. So I had to go to the hospital in Portugal. They put me in the hospital. They they made me actually pee, and so when I peed, it was it was like dark brown, like you're dehydrated. Jeez. They instantly put it. They instantly put an IV on me, and then like within a matter of like an hour I actually started to feel like wow I can I felt better obviously because they were hydrating me they were putting yeah. nutrients in my body and stuff and so um after about four hours after two or three bags I was fine and well not fine but I was better and when we were leaving the hospital my tour manager was like yeah you know I go let me know how much it is because then I can just pay I'll just pay you whatever right yeah and he goes yeah it's gonna be 35 and I'm like Oh, thirty five hundred dollars. Okay, that's not too bad. And he goes, No, no, no. It's going to be thirty five euro. I'm like thirty five euro. That's yeah. it. Yeah, yeah. I think that's. I mean, in America, you're paying like thirty five grand. <laughs> I know. I mean, we we certainly in the UK. I mean, our NHS is. It, it's. I wouldn't say on its last legs, but it's definitely not in the greatest of health. But compared to the situation in America, I mean, it's. It's mad. I mean, I just, it's so crazy when I speak to Americans and there is a certain, I, I guess it's, I guess it's where your politics lie, but there's a certain faction of Americans I've spoken to that just don't understand the idea of free healthcare. They just think it's almost like an abomination, but I don't know, man, it's so yeah. reassuring to know that if I got ill, I am essentially going to be looked after. Yeah. Years, years ago in the nineties, I went to the hospital in Canada you know, I filled out the paperwork. Doctor saw me. I was all good. Gave me some medication, and I, I left. And I'm like, oh shit! I better, I better take off running. Like I didn't, like you know, I felt like yeah, I was stealing yeah. something. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. But it was yeah. like it was free. And well, I felt listen. like I was stealing something. I'm like, I better get in the car quick and get out of here before they charge me. <laughs> yeah, no, totally. I think I think a lot of Ameri- I think a lot of Americans are, are, are kind of scared of socialism what's uh how what's the what's the land like in uh what's the land like like where you are now i feel a little bit like america is gearing up for a uh a year of chaos next year Oof. 
So who knows what's going to happen next year? I mean, once I don't even want to talk about this guy, but once he starts to run and starts to, you know, really start gearing up for next year, it's going to be a battle. It's going to be crazy. Yeah. I mean, it's not just going to be with that, but it's just going to be people in general. And it's, yeah. it's going to be, it's going to be more ugly. It's going to be very ugly. It's going to yeah. be another civil war in, in America. It's going to be, everybody's fighting, going to be fighting with each other, literally. But I don't want, I don't want to, I don't really want to get into politics. Every time I get into politics, I, you know, there's always going to be somebody that's going to disagree with you and then I'm going to get death threats. Again. So, <laughs> you know, I know. You know what I mean? no, no, absolutely. It is an interesting time to speak to you though. I feel like, I've had so many conversations recently within people within my profession about AI, and I can't I can't think about AI without thinking of Fear Factory and almost that you were kind of uh, sounding the alarm like some time ago, <laughs> way it's... back, yeah, way back, exactly. Yeah, you know what how, I mean, how do you feel about what's going on? Well, you know, it's 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 of course, you know. It, I'm going to say the same thing that we've been saying. You know, it all depends on how we decide to use it as a society. Obviously, you know, the military is basically where a lot of this AI is being created because they have the most money, they have the most funding. And so basically all of our wars are really not going to be done hand-to-hand combat. It's going to be all, you know, taking down, you know, the grid, you know, taking down, you know, cutting cutting electricity, cutting, you know, water, cutting all that stuff just to, but, you know, it's unfortunate that us humans, you know, regular civilians are the one who's going to have to really suffer the casualties more than the actual military. You know what I mean? Yeah. 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 I do feel it's, it's so weird how in the West innovation is kind of driven by either the military industrial complex or the porn industry they're the people with the money and they're the people who correct are- that's exactly what i've been saying like the first the first robots are going to be fucking female prostitute robots that you know yeah, yeah. you know what i mean <laughs> fembots as they, as they say you know what i mean yeah no, I, I yeah I've, I've been saying that for a long time um but you know ai you know can be a very inspiring thing you know you know going way back to the fear factory concepts i mean the the the, the very first thing that we you know the very first title that we had for our record, soul of a new machine. That pretty much said it all. It was the it was the birth of this technology. That was record was released in 1992. You know, we were fans of all the early sci-fi movies and all the science fiction books, and we've been following that stuff for a long time. It's always intrigued us, especially you know going way back to you know the 70s with the early Star Wars and the Blade Runners, and in the 80s you know with the with the Terminators and the Dunes and all that stuff. All those movies really, really, really inspired us in the concepts of this. And then we would just go out and buy books and buy magazines that would feature all this stuff. Just be really fascinated by it. And, you know, you know, me and, you know, Burton at the time were just like sponges with all this stuff. You know, even going back to um, the Twilight Zone. You know what I mean? Yeah. You, you know, it's as simple as the Twilight Zone. You know, you didn't think like the Twilight Zone would inspire uh, us to write a whole concept about where technology was going. There was a, there was an episode where I don't remember the exact, the exact title, but it was about how man was becoming obsolete and how technology was taking over. And it was actual, it was a simple thing of a librarian. He was a librarian and they were telling him his job is obsolete because now there's no more books. Yeah. Right. And, um, and that he as a human, because he has no, he has no use in society, because librarians don't exist anymore. In this episode, that his job and him and him as a human was obsolete. So you know, um, so so we pretty much wrote a whole concept about it. How we saw things changing, evolving. You know, from CDs for us, for us, you know, as musicians, like. CDs were changing, you know, CDs was changing, it was all going on, you know, uh, streaming services. Uh, we saw that. And we also saw the battle between like Garth Brooks and, you know, uh, you know, Lars Ulrich with Napster. You know, we started, we started seeing that stuff, you know, Garth Brooks was talking about how they were selling secondhand CDs and how these music stores were making money off selling used CDs 
but the artists weren't getting a cut of that anymore. You know what I mean? Yeah. So there was a lot of things that were changing in that time that we started to write about. We started, we started to realize that like stuff like Sirius XM and certain, you know, Wi-Fi uh, 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 radio stations were going get and and we saw radio stations become obsolete. Now it was all digital programmed. You know, they didn't have to hire a DJ anymore. You know, there's a lot of things were changing within the music industry that we saw. You know, of course, you know, a few years later we had social media and all that stuff, and how that really changed and. We were just talking about we we just saw a lot of that coming, and we just decided to write a whole concept about it. How just that you better embrace change. Like for instance, right now, you know the writers, all the all the people who write for the shows and for yeah, yeah. movies and television, their jobs are becoming obsolete because now they're going to have AI. AI is going to be replacing them. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. You know we you know but but at the same time we people knew that was coming i mean it's it's only a a matter of time before a lot of music is going to be replaced in that way too but i think that you know um musicians are entertainers i'm i'm going to i'm going to put it as a whole entertainers are still going to be needed you know because people still want to see live entertainment yeah i mean that was what i was going to ask you to be honest i i, I think that sorry i went on a whole tangent no, it's fine. You covered you covered a lot of ground. I, I I guess the I guess the the thing that worries me is whenever there's change, and I I think you have to get on board with change, or you become... you're gonna have to adapt. You're gonna have to adapt. Just like our last record, uh, Recoded. One of the things, one of the big. If you open the CD or you look in the back of the CD, it says adapt or die. That's pretty much what it's gonna be. You have to you're gonna have to survive. You're gonna have to adapt. You're gonna have to make changes. I mean, we all have to do it. Yeah, no, absolutely. I guess my worry a bit is never about the technology, it's about the human impact. So I guess it's that thing, you know, almost going back to that Twilight Zone episode. I saw it where I grew up. I grew up in a like a a village that centered around a coal mine and then when the when the pit closed, like people did get jobs. They they retrained and went into new industries, but for a period of time it really there was like real kind of social deprivation in the village because people had lost this sense of purpose and community that was around the pit. And I think that that's my worry is that almost like if humans feel like they're becoming obsolete, like what does that do in terms of, does that make them angry? And like none of these things are good for society. But, but you also got to look at it as like, it's also created a lot of new opportunities for a lot of people, social yeah, media, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. you know, I'm, I'm going to love that in with AI as well. Social media has created a lot of new opportunities for people because, uh, you know, look at OnlyFans. Look how much people are. Look how many uh, internet stars we started having. You know, social media stars, what they call as content creators. You know, people, you know, girls who are making hundreds of thousands of dollars, millions of dollars. The everyday average teacher who decided to not be a teacher anymore because she was making, you know, over a million dollars on OnlyFans a year. You know, what I mean. So it's created new opportunities for people to make money, right? And there are some benefits to AI because, you know, now that we're going to have a, you know, a lot of AI, it's, it's becoming more, extremely more intelligent computing that's going to be able to create new medicines. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. Uh, it's going to be able to help us fight diseases, you know, certain diseases, eliminate, hopefully, hopefully eliminate poverty, give us, hopefully give us peace. Is it like no war, you know? Yeah, I but, mean, also, the, the, oh, but also there's a, also there's a mega dark side to all this. You know that. Yeah, I, I think that I, I think that it is important to accentuate the positives, though. I mean, I just need to say, in case my mum is listening to this episode, that when you were talking about only your films, mom, I, you said. Yeah, sometimes she listens to the podcast. If she's listening oh, okay. to this episode, I needed to know that when you're talking about OnlyFans, I have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> Well, let's, let's just say that, you know, it's created a lot of opportunities for average people to make money online. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's a good one. Listen, I, I've been, uh, I've been, a, I've been dipping in and out of your band's catalog for a long time. I have always really felt like in so many ways, Fear Factory pioneered so much of the stuff I love. 
you know, I'm really into very technical metal. I'm into very, I don't want to say fantastical because it's not like you're singing about dragons and stuff, but there is a, an escape <laughs> in there. You know, there is, like you were saying with the sci-fi stuff. Well, you... everybody has a theme. You know what I mean? Every every band to me has a theme. You have a, a black metal band. What's their theme? Satan. You know yeah, what I mean? You say, you say <laughs> that, you say that, but I think increasingly that, I, I think increasingly. I think, I think we're, we're talking more socially aware than actually science. You know, things, sure, you can call it science fiction. Sure, you can call it a futurist predict, somebody predicting the future. Yeah. Or just somebody, or just a band that's singing about what they see in a different aspect than what most people see. You know what I mean? Yeah, uh, I, I think, though. And talking you, about it. I think your band always has such a strong aesthetic, though. I mean, I was, like, you know, huge fan of the aliens movie alien and aliens those movies oh, and i was i was i was big on geiger and the artwork and like you know oh, when, I saw, yeah. when you saw well, someone wearing yeah. a fear factory t-shirt you were like you, you knew what the band was about before you'd even heard them i guess what i'm trying to say is that do you feel like fear factory get the respect they deserve that's always a hard question for me to answer i mean it's always difficult because you know we do have our diehard fans that think that we're the biggest band in the world yeah, you know, but to overall, we're nothing. We're nothing compared to to what the bigger bands are. And, you know, I believe that in overall grand scheme of the, the the music industry and our genre, that no, we don't. We don't get the credit. But like I said, our fans think that we're the fucking the shit and we're the biggest thing. And they really <laughs> get into the concept of the record. They really get. They really get it. They really like it. You know, they're really into every instrument, every note. You know they're into all of it, so I mean, you know I, mean, I teeter totter on both sides. I mean, you can you can never say that Fear Factory aren't a big band, but why do you feel like that maybe that kind of next tier has eluded you? Hmm. I think that we might have been a little bit, just a little bit too early. Right. Like if a song like if D Manufacture would have came out a few years later, like later in the nineties, you know. Or early two thousands, like when Kill Switch, Kill Switch Engage started to hit, stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, maybe we would have gotten more credit because we would have got. But I think that we were kind of lumped in. We were kind of like when music, we were in the middle of when music was shifting, because you had, you had the thrash metal, right scene that died in the in the early nineties. We're talking like ninety one, ninety two, to ninety four. There was a time when there was a major shift. There was Nirvana, Pearl Jam, all those, all those bands killed a lot of the bands that were from the nineties. Yeah. I'm sorry, from the eighties. Yeah, like all the early thrash, all the all the hair metal stuff, all that was gone, and music just changed the grunge. It was a night and day. Sure, there's gonna be thrash metal. Sure, there's gonna be thrash metal. Do you saying? Thrash Devil never died. It was always there. Yeah, to them it was. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. you were talking about a music industry, a musical music industry. It died, right? A lot of those bands disappeared for a while. Hair metal bands disappeared. All this stuff they they all took a break when this whole grunge thing just took over, and we were right in the middle of that. And then all of a sudden, about about ninety six, corn started to hit, and then it shifted again to new metal. So we were kind of in the middle there, and we were doing something different. We did get some attention, but it was never that. I just think that we were just maybe we were just a little too too early. Yeah, I mean, I was like I said, like... it was a big shift. So we were kind of like stuck in the middle of all that chaos. Yeah, I mean, I always felt like you know almost like a band like System or Deftones that. Obviously, you were kind of part of the new metal thing, but I didn't really see you as a new metal band. But that, that kind of that scene, it definitely was. You were kind of there or thereabouts. But I, I just think there were some bands that were so obviously formed for that scene. But you were just well, we you do have to be there. We do have a new metal connection. I'll put it this way. So, and that connection was Ross Robinson. Yeah. Ross Robinson is a is a well known producer. He produced the foreign, first Corn record. First Lip Biscuit record, first Soulfly record, first Slipknot record. He produced a lot of records that were in the new metal genre that blew the fuck up, <laughs> basically. Yeah. 
Yeah. Um, he also produced our first demo. All oh, right. I, um, I didn't know that. Yeah. It, it later came out uh, in 2001 or 2002 called, it was called Concrete. Oh, so okay. it was, yeah. it was the first demo that we did, the first album demo um, that never got released. And then it got released in 2002. It was called Concrete. So Ross Robinson did that did that. And from what I was told that he actually used that demo to shop to Korn. And Korn oh, really? heard that demo and and he told Korn, "Hey, look, this is what I can do for your band. This is the latest thing I produced." And then next thing you know, he produced the Korn demo, which later on led to producing the first Korn record. So there is a connection in a way you yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. So, I, I, I think also just the fact, though, that there was, you know, because there was this blending of genre, I think that's kind of what solidifies you within that scene. Like I say, I just thought that it was, there's a, there's a load of bands that I think that don't, that aren't really even in currency anymore that I think of when I think of, of new metal and factory aren't. And I guess that kind of leads me to what I was going to ask next, which is that, it feels like you're you've just started or you're about to embark on this new chapter of Fear Factory, new members, like big changes. How how are you how is that feeling at this point in time? It feels amazing. It feels very exciting. But you know though, that's how I feel about every record we do. Like it's a whole new chapter. Okay. Sure, some of the members might be the same, some of the members might be different. But it's always to me. It's always look at as I always look at a new record of okay. I need to prove myself again. I need to make a statement again. I need to, you know, m make it as sick conceptually as possible. You know what I mean? I need to try to have the best production. You know, I always look at every record like that as a big thing. You know what I mean? And it's and it's always exciting. Sometimes it's it's pressure that you put on yourself and i think the pressure for me is good because it really pushes me to do my best um and uh right now it's very exciting you know we got milo silvestro who's the new new singer and he's amazing he's an amazing guy in in he's an amazing singer obviously he's a lot of people have seen the youtube videos they know he can do it now all it is that we have to show the world is what it's going to sound like once we record. And I can't wait for everybody to hear what we're working on. It's going to be a little bit, but they're going to be able to hear something cool. Yeah, I keep hearing that you are planning a single this year. I'm pushing myself to put a single out this year, yeah. But there was a little bit of setback. I couldn't talk for a month. Yeah, of course, yeah. So yeah. I couldn't talk to the producer. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, so, yeah of course, of course. Yeah. Um, but now... Go ahead. Yeah, it it got a bit ugly for a moment there though with the with the communication with Burton. It felt like it was all kind of being done in the press. Did you was that Weird. Pain, was that yeah. painful how that played out? Um, it was sad to see how it played out. You know, uh, I wouldn't say painful because I, you know him not communicating was basically me telling me he's gone, he's leaving, which it's not new in the Fear Factory camp because he has quit in two or three times before. Yeah. Just you guys didn't know about it. Some people knew about it. Some people didn't know about it. You know, obviously it happened way back in 2002. Yeah. He quit, you know, and it happened a couple of times after that. But it just, we didn't make a big media storm about it. We just try to make things happen again. But yeah. this time it was, it was much different. This time it was a lot of the courts and, the legalities of a lawsuit that kind of led people to really, you know, spread apart and not want to be around each other anymore. And that's just how it is. Yeah. Like, like with any divorce, I, I just kind of hope that all parties are, are happier on the other side of it. Well, I'm definitely happy on the other side of it. Um, because, you know, I, I'm excited to people to hear some new fear factory and, um, you know, it's not, going to be it's kind of it's we're kind of in a weird place right now because some people are like well the singer sounds like burton oh the singer sound, doesn't sound different enough oh the singer sounds too different 
So you, it's kind of a, we're in that weird position at the moment where is it, do you want it to sound too Fear Factory? Do you want it to sound different Fear Factory? Are people going to be disappointed because it sounds different? Are people going to be disappointed because it sounds too much the same? Yeah. So we're kind of in the, we're kind of in the, in the middle there again, stuck in the middle. <laughs> and uh, we're just going to do our fucking best. And I know it's going to be killer. That I know. But it's just going to see how the people react to it. So I know you've got these shows in Europe and the UK from October. Do you think there'll be any new stuff in the set? Uh, new stuff is a what? Brand, brand new? That's something that's not released? Well, just with you talking about maybe getting a single out before. Oh, okay. Um, yes. If we make the single out by the time that tour starts or during the tour, for sure, it'll be in the set. I think that's very exciting. Very exciting. Oh, totally exciting. Totally exciting. I did put out an instrumental track for a plugin that I did with Joey Sturgis Tones called the Disruptor plugin. Right. And the song was called The Roboticist. And that song will be featured on the new album. But I don't know if I'm going to release it as a single yet. But the instrumental came out. So if anybody wants to hear a little bit of a taste of what's to come, they could go to uh, the Fear Factory YouTube or, you know, you can check it out on there. Exciting stuff, man. Listen, Dino, I'm so pleased that we uh, finally got to connect. I'm, uh, I'm very much looking forward to hearing the next stage of Fear Factory, and I hope that you avoid any tour-related illness from this point on. <laughs> yeah, I hope so, too. You know, just stuff happens. You know, you've been, I've been touring for, you know, 30 years, so things happen when you're on the road. What about the, what about reindustrialize? You don't like, you didn't want to talk about that? Well, I just thought that we'd. I was looking at the clock, and I was thinking, "Oh, I've almost." I, hit I got nothing. I got nothing else for the next uh, fifteen minutes. Oh, nice. Okay. Well, yeah. Tell me all. Tell me all about how you feel about the uh, the <laughs> putting that back into the world. Yeah. So we were we were kind of stuck in a rock and hard place when we came out with the album The Industrialist because at the time we had no record. We were getting pressured by the record company to go ahead and to hurry up and put a record out. Um, we previously had Gene Hoagland in the band um, for the album Mechanize, which came out in 2010. Um, but after that touring cycle, we were getting, we were gearing up to do the industrialist and um, we were under negotiations with a new contract with Gene Hogan. But unfortunately we um, basically, we couldn't afford him because he was asking, his asking price was way too high than what we were willing to pay. So he ended up going to Testament. And playing the testament and um so we were kind of stuck without a drummer so we decided when we when we created when we create records even even way back when raymond herrera was in the band we used a drum program or a drum machine to actually write some of the stuff and and then raymond would go and play it or whatever drummer we would have would go play it yeah um so we would write with a drum program anyways so what we decided to do on the industrialist was actually just used the drum program that, you, that we wrote with. So we used, decided to use that and not have a drummer. Um, and when we released the record in 2012, a lot of people were disappointed that there was no drummer on the album. So no live drummer. Right. And so, um, which is kind of ironic because, you know, most people – would would think that because we are fear factory and we are talking about you know ai and yeah, technology yeah, yeah. and stuff like that that we would that people would be understanding that we were using uh, a a drum program to uh, to do the album but a lot of people were disappointed we got a lot of bad reviews it was horrible it was really bad it was almost like the record got you know canceled um yeah i mean so listen- you know there's some decent reviews when you look, you know, when you look back, I mean, there is like, I mean, it was just, I feel a little bit like it was, it was a weird, it was a weird time when that record emerged, like music was in kind of like a, a, a strange place. But when you, you know, when you look on Wikipedia and you look back on the reviews that record received, they, they, they were decent. They were, uh, not, <laughs> you know, not, not, the, not compared not to that you remember. Not compared not compared to Mechanize. Right, yeah. You know what I mean? Okay, okay. Mechanize had rave reviews, like, oh, shit, the band's back. Dino's back. Oh, my God. Blah. You know, it's just like, it was exciting. Yeah, okay. And we came up to the industrialist, and then you, you obviously you could read 
and hear fans' opinion directly, instantly. Yeah. yeah. Uh, this is shite, Mike, because of fucking. There's no fucking, you know, drummer on it. Blah 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 blah. You know what I mean? Was was that? But you was, heard all was, that. Was that an Australian accent or a British accent? I mean, you could. Yeah, well, it was somewhere in the middle. Right. Right. But uh, but. Uh, um, but you could hear and feel the negativity. I mean, you even, even the band's shows got smaller. Yeah. Okay. So we felt it. It wasn't just me saying that, just reading some reviews online. No, it, you felt it all the way across. You know what I mean? Well, well and, I, guess, uh, I guess the question is, is why would you pick that scab by reworking it for this release? I'll tell you why. So, um, we were signed to a different record. We had a licensing deal with a different record company called Candlelight Records. Yeah, that was the label that put it out. And after a certain amount of after a certain amount of years, those records come back to us. So we uh, we were going to re we were going to license it. Oh, we did license it to Nuclear Blast. And a and R guy Monty Connor goes, "Hey man, wouldn't it be cool if we went back and added live drums?" I'm like, "Yeah, let's go do that." So I thought it was a good idea, and so we did. Mike Keller, the drummer that we had for a long time, uh, went back and re-recorded the drums, and it completely gave the album a different feel. It almost like it gave it new life. And you know, we added a couple little parts here and there, nothing really too drastically different, but we added some different roles and stuff like that. And then I went back and I reamped the guitars, give it make it a little bit more beefier. Um, Greg Greeley. Uh, the guy who actually uh, mixed and produced Team Manufacture and Obsolete, sorry, and a few other of our records, went back in and remixed it. And it basically made it almost sound like a new record. I had people calling me, about, hey man, that new song, New Messiah, sounds great. I'm like, I never told them it wasn't a new song. Yeah, yeah, yeah. People just thought it was. Yeah. You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. And so I. I, now that people now people have the option, so some a lot of people love it, and a lot of people like the original, so they have a choice now. Depending on your depending on your taste on organic drums, yeah, exactly. Organic drums versus you know digital drums, and also we changed the cover a little bit. The cover looks really good. Some people, you know, we didn't change it too drastically, but it was enough to know that it's different, and um, people like that too. So it's kind of cool. Tell me about the remixes and the cover versions that it's being packaged with. Yeah. Um, we, when we were making that record, we decided to do a bunch of B-side tracks. Um, uh, and we decided to do songs that really inspired us from the beginning. Um, uh, a band called Big Big Black. Well, that's what, uh, one of my favorite bands, so that's very yeah. exciting. Yeah. Well, you know, you know Steve Albini. You know, he's yeah. worked with Nirvana. Yeah, back in the early, back in the day, yeah, he worked Dixies, with Nirvana. Yeah, 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 a lot of bands, and I just love we loved his band way back in the day. I mean, um, I mean, they had a, I mean, you know, they played with a drum machine though. Of course, mm. of course, they were like you know pre pre Godflesh type stuff. You know what yeah, I mean? Yeah. Um, and uh, you know we were big fans of theirs, and uh, we did, we we wanted to do Kerosene, but a friend of mine's band did Kerosene back in the day. So we decided to do Passing Complexion because that was my second favorite song from that album. And I thought we I thought we did it justice. You know, if you go back and listen to it, it's pretty it's pretty close, of, of, of course, with a more modern production. But it was pretty good. And then um, Sonic Violence, a band based out of the UK who we were fans of. And we just decided to give them a little fucking, you know, do a cover song. And I, the singer reached out to me and said, you know, thank this for doing it. I thought it was really cool. You know that there was like some little obscure band from England that uh, yeah, yeah. you know we were we were paying attention to. Um, and of course, Pitch Shifter. I mean, Pitch Shifter was one of those um, bands that really inspired us from the beginning. Um, and the song Landfill. I just wanted to do that song for a long time. I just I just love the first the first line. Hate. I've you know. Hey, I hate you, motherfucker. <laughs> you know, it's just like yeah. those, you know, those first lyrics, you know, his first line was like, that's it. Yeah. I another, was hooked. Another band that I don't really feel like always get the credit they deserve. 
yes. I mean, we could do ministry and Nine Inch Nails, and everybody's done that. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Or we could do Black Sabbath. Everybody's done Black Sabbath. So I just wanted to pick some obscure bands. Just like, you know, going all the way back to D Manufacture, there's a cover song on D Manufacture. Some people don't even know it's a cover song, but the song is called um, Dog Day Sunrise. It's about from a band called Head of David, which is a band that uh, Justin Broderick from Godflesh was in. He was playing drums in that band. And this, you're, you're going back, you know, the early 80s. And that was something that we what really inspired us as well. And so we put that on team manufacturer. Pay it back, man. Pay it back, exactly. And so, you know, we like those bands that maybe weren't so big or weren't so commercially successful. You know, we wanted to give them homage to or homage to um, to what we what what inspired us. Well, listen, I'm really pleased. I'm gonna have to, I'm gonna have to do my ending again now because you told me off for not asking you enough questions about the uh, about the 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 re- reindustrialized. Um, how how can how can we end this now that I've I've spunked my uh, original ending away? This is what we could say. Look, we're going to be out in the UK in October. I hope that we see everybody out there. I also want to give a big thank you to everybody who supported us over the years. Um, you know, uh, all the journalists who've given us the opportunity and the platform to talk and to be able to talk to everybody out there. And so we just want to say a big thank you to everyone. Dino, thank you so much for speaking to me, man. All right, man. Have a good day. Take care yourself, dude. Bye. Bye. <laughs>